I'm really excited now uh, for our next two presentations. Um, we have next uh, Pablos Holman. And, you know, when I was thinking of Pablos, uh, I kind of free associated and thought of Pablo Picasso, who's famous, at least in computer science circles, for saying once, computers are useless. They only give you answers. And I think uh, from Pablos Holman, uh, we'll find out that that's wrong, that computers give you much, much more than answers. Pablos is a futurist, a cyber expert, an inventor, and a hacker. And today, he'll give us a talk that will give us a deeper glimpse into the hacker mindset and how it associates with the, our understanding of the world around us and invention. So please join me in welcoming Pablos Holman. Hey, thank you. Okay, so any other hackers in the room tonight? Couple? All right. Good. Um, first, we're just going to talk about a few things that hackers can do. Um, so I travel a lot. This is a hotel room, kind of like I tend to stay in. Um, not a very exciting place to hang out, but that TV is not like the TV in your house. That TV is a node on a network, and it's connected to all the other TVs in the hotel. And if you're a bored hacker, and you plug one of these things into your computer, it's a USB infrared transceiver. It allows me to send codes to the TV that it's not expecting. So the remote in the room can change the channel a little bit. I can change the channel and make it show me movies for free. <laughs> Which, you know, isn't too big of a deal. Maybe I can play games for free. But I can not only do this for my TV in my hotel room, I can control your TV in your hotel room. So I get to decide if you're watching Disney or porn tonight. <laughs> if there's online checkout, you can put in your credit card number. I can watch you do that. Um, these are, if there's a keyboard hooked up, some of them have, so you can surf the internet from your hotel room on the TV. Well, what do people do? The usual stuff. They log into their banks. <laughs> I don't know why they think this is a good idea. These are just pictures we've taken of TVs in our hotels. Funds transfer. What are you doing on your hotel <laughs> TV? Really big funds transfers. <laughs> and, you know, in case you run out of things to do in Las Vegas, you can sit in your hotel and surf the net, <laughs> look for something to do. Back when Wi-Fi was getting first popularized, we started trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, sort of explore the security properties of Wi-Fi. We figured out ways to crack the encryption on that. We built this robot called the HackerBot, which could drive around and find Wi-Fi users, drive up to them, and show them their passwords on the screen, <laughs> which you know we thought was good for a laugh. And um, <laughs> if you're going to build a robot, it ought to do something. So um, continuing on those kinds of things, we tried to show, this is a project I did with Ben Lorry to try and show uh, passive surveillance. So this is uh, a conference called the Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference, and there were three different levels. And what we did is I just went and put a computer in each room of the conference, and I had it uh, log Bluetooth traffic. So as people came by with their phones and laptops, I would just record their Bluetooth ID and then dump that into a database and allow me to make a map like this for everybody at the conference. So this is the map for Kim Cameron. At the time, he was the chief privacy architect at Microsoft, <laughs> unbeknownst to him. I know he went to this session for 15 minutes, got bored, went downstairs, came up, hung out in the lobby. I can print a map like this for everyone else and correlate them to show who he hangs out with and who his friends are and stuff like that. Now, this is an unintended side effect of Bluetooth. This is not what the designers had in mind. But we figured out what's possible. You could do the same kind of thing with, the, uh, with IDs in, in Wi-Fi or in GSM with different equipment. 
It's in your cell phones. You could do it with RFIDs and passports and credit cards. It's just sort of a side effect of deploying these technologies. It's not what we plan. So, you know, you could imagine, say, put one of these computers out in front of the Congress, put another one out in front of the Triple X store, and maybe the Catholic Church. We'll just see what we can correlate and figure out. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I don't know what you'd find. I'm just guessing. Um, this is a buddy of ours named Sammy who's trying to figure out how to meet chicks on MySpace. Anybody here ever use MySpace? No? It's kind of like uh, Facebook for your grandparents, really old. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sammy uh, didn't have any friends on MySpace. And so you know from Facebook if you have a page about you and people can see who your friends are. And if you have a bunch of friends, you seem kind of cool. If you don't have any friends, you don't seem very cool at all. Sammy was not seeming very cool, so what he did is he wrote a little bit of code that he could put on his page so that whenever you look at his page, it would just automatically add you as his friend. And it would skip the whole, is Sammy really your friend protocol. And, um, and then it would change your page to say that Sammy is my hero, because that was one way he thought would make him seem more cool. And then what it would do is one more thing. It would copy that code to your page so that whenever anybody looked at your page, it would just automatically add them as Sammy's friend too. <laughs> you got it. So in under 24 hours, Sammy had over a million friends on MySpace. <laughs> um, he served three years probation for that, and you know, <laughs> now he's on Facebook. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Another buddy of ours, Christopher A. Bad, another hacker, managed to meet some girls on MySpace, but he was having spotty results. So Abad took their profiles from the girls he dated and liked and fed them into a spam filter as legitimate email, took profiles from girls he dated and did not like and fed them into his spam filter as spam. And spam filters use artificial intelligence to try and figure out the difference so it can sort your mail, right? Well, Abad just ran his spam filter against every profile on MySpace and outspits girls you might like to date, which I think is brilliant repurposing of a spam filter. You know, why do you need Match.com if you can have spam dating, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's a reason I'm telling you about these guys, right? So um, what's going on here is these guys think differently, right? They have a different kind of brain that works different than, from most other people. And what's cool about that is that they're good at figuring out what's possible. A good example of this is, you know, if you get a new gadget and show it to your mom or your grandma, she might say, well, what does this do? And you can explain, mom, it's a phone. Oh, I got it, phone, <laughs> no problem. Doot, 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 doot. But if you give a new gadget to a hacker, the question is different. The question is, what can I make this do? And I'm gonna flip it over and take all the screws out and break it into a lot of little pieces. But then I'm gonna figure out what can I build from the rubble? And this process of discovery, of figuring out what's possible with every new technology, with every new bit of science, that's fundamental to invention, right? Every single thing we do technologically starts here. We have to discover what's possible. And you don't discover what's possible by reading the directions, right? These guys are violating the warranty before they even got the package open, right? And so it's really important to understand that, you know, they're thinking differently, they're doing some crazy stuff, a lot of it's not going to work. A lot of it seems totally pointless, but they're going to figure out what's possible. And that's what's so exciting about technology. That's why I work in technology, is that every time we get a new bit of science or a new computer chip or a sensor, we get to go reimagine everything that humans have ever done. We get to go ask ourselves that question of, you know, hey, does this change the way we do some things? Does this change the way that we you know, eat or drink? Does this the way, change the way that we drive cars? Does this change the way that we, you know, take care of sick people? 
right? We have to ask every time we get a new superpower that technology has given us. And that's what these guys are really good at doing. Um, anybody use keys like this to open your car? Bloop. Um, you saw Yoshi speak earlier. He's doing it the complicated way, but that's because he's a real scientist. <laughs> being a hacker is kind of like being a scientist, but without all the formal training and accountability. <laughs> Kids these days will take a, take a key like that and go driving through a Walmart parking lot and click open, 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 bloop. And eventually you'll find another Jetta or whatever that looks kind of like yours, different color but it has the same key code. And so, they, you know, they'll loot it, lock it up, and go. No evidence of a break-in. And that's because your car is not really a car. It's a PC on wheels, right? And it has inherited a whole bunch of problems that we know about, and some that we don't yet know about, from PCs. We went through this problem a long time ago with our PCs, right? And we learned about what's called key space. And it turns out, the giant random numbers are free, and we could use a different one for every key, but that hasn't occurred to the auto industry yet. They're used to, <laughs> they're used to shipping a car. <laughs> and for one manufacturer, we actually figure out how to manipulate the key so that it'll open every car from that manufacturer. <laughs> so like, the video I actually want to make and haven't done yet is like drive by the dealership and <laughs> bloop. <laughs> <laughs> But to open them all at once and just film the face on the salesman. <laughs> and if I take Yoshi, he can start them all too. Um, <laughs> but the point is, you know, where's system update for your car, right? It's not online. They don't have a plan for fixing this. That's why I'm not telling you which car it is, right? You can roll them all into the dealership and swap out a part like they used to do. But every industry... Again, this is how I'm telling you how we cheat. This is something we know because we've been using computers. And every other industry is becoming a computer industry. What happens if you open that up? There's a computer chip and a battery. What happens if you open up this TV? On the back, inside, computer chip, power supply. What happens if you open your phone? Computer chip, power supply. All this stuff is the same. It's all a PC. Your toaster, if it's not yet, will soon be a PC, right? Everything is. And that's just because it's an easy way, it's a cheap way for us to add a lot of functionality into something, make it useful. But it means that because we've been using PCs for a long time, and because we've been hacking on PCs for a long time, it gives us these superpowers, and you can, you can see them coming. Anybody, here's the old-fashioned stuff. So anybody here ever try to pick locks? A few? Yeah, good, okay. So these guys can tell you they were probably using tools like this. You stick them in the lock and you finick with it for a long time and if you have OCD then you'll figure it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> unfortunately it's hard to find those people these days <laughs> um, at least where I hang out. So for the ADD kids in the house I'm going to show you the easy way. So this is a lock, a Schlage lock like the one in the picture here. Right? Statistically it's on like half of the front doors in America because it's the cheapest lock at Home Depot. But what I'm going to show you work on any, any lock. So I brought one. This is a key, it's a Schlage key, so it'll fit in there, but it won't turn the lock because it's not the right key. I modified it and cut all the teeth down to the lowest settings. So I just pop that in there, smack it a few times. Oh, we're in. We just picked a lock. That was really easy, huh? Um, you don't actually need to know any more about this. You guys could do this. There's, the technique is called bump key. There's videos on YouTube of 11-year-old girls showing you how to do it. Um, <laughs> and I actually uh, bought a key machine, because this is the kind of nuts that we are. And so we could make a key ring with all the other keys for the other locks in America. So if you, know, if you get locked out, call me or, or look on YouTube. Um, but you know, I think this is really interesting. That's like the last mechanical thing in your life. You need to learn to pick locks right now because it's the last chance you're going to get to interact with something mechanical. Everything else, we took the mechanical stuff, we replaced it with a pile of electronics, a chip, and a power supply, right? And, you know, 
this is it. That's the last frontier. And it's only going to be a couple more years. In fact, the lock on my door, this is the one I, I had on my door until I replaced it with a lock that's controlled by my iPhone. So now I just go like this. And you, I don't know if you can see this, but I've got lock and unlock. Actually, I'll just do it. Let's unlock my front door. Yeah. OK, that'll probably scare my wife and daughter and, and my guard dog. <laughs> OK, anyway. All right, so <laughs> All right, there was a point. OK, so anybody here? Ever use these USB thumb drives? Print my Word document for me? One guy? OK. It's like the new floppy disk for those of you who haven't upgraded yet. Um, <laughs> mine is kind of like yours, except that while you're printing my Word document, you know, magically and invisibly in the background, it's just making a handy backup of your My Documents folder, your browser history and cookies, all the passwords. They go in a little hidden folder on here. In case you ever need it, you can come see me. No. Um, <laughs> I like to you know, print you know, logos like Cisco or whatever on these and just sprinkle them around at conferences and see what, see what lands in my inbox. OK. Um, <laughs> credit cards. Anybody here use credit cards? A few? They're, they're, yeah, they're kind of on the way out, I assume. Um, we know that waitresses can take a pencil rubbing of a credit card, so they're not wildly secure. And that really aggravates hackers. You know, for years we've been complaining, hey, credit cards are insecure. Why don't you do something about it? And, uh, eventually, we finally, recent, you know, a few years ago, got a new credit card in the mail. It came with a letter explaining how it was our new secure credit card. And um, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I get something in the mail that says it's new and secure, I get kind of excited. So, <laughs> um, and we know a little bit about this. The reason it's supposed to be secure is there's a computer chip in there called an RFID so that um, you can read it wirelessly. And, um, and we know a little bit about RFIDs and figure, well, there's probably a crypto system in there. And so what we need to do is crack the encryption system and then we'll be able to steal credit cards for fun on the weekends with our robot. And, um, and what we did, so I bought a bunch of RFID gear on the internet to get ready to crack this thing. One of the things I got was this reader on eBay for $8. It's the same one that you see on the counter at Starbucks or in some taxi cabs. And then we had to make this complicated cable, which means we had to use a soldering iron. So it's real complicated hacking. Anybody have one of these new fangled credit cards with RFID in it? Yeah. Come on up. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> what do you think could happen? <laughs> no, don't answer that. Um, nobody wants to volunteer to bring their, their new. What, you, what's that? Yeah, right. OK, so wrap it in tinfoil. Um, do I have a volunteer? Are you, you bringing me a credit card? OK, so I don't know if you guys use Python for your presentations, but I do. <laughs> it's, 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 the scientific studies have shown that PowerPoint makes you stupid. There is no study like that for Python. Come on, put it in your pocket and come on up here. OK, so I'm going to plug in my, my reader from eBay. OK. Oh, is that the wrong one? Oh, I got it. OK, Same it's one. in the pocket. OK, it's in the pocket. Same card I have. OK, so come over here. OK, return. Are you guys ready? What do you think is going to happen? Hello. Oh. What's going on there? Oh, that looks boring. Shit. OK, we're going to steal my credit card. Hold on. It's in my back pocket. Beep. Did you hear the beep? That's how you know a hacker is stealing your credit card. OK, something's wrong with his. Um, but this is the problem with hackers. We have no like QA department, so <laughs> stuff breaks all the time. Um, thank you. Uh, but you can see we stole my, which I know is less fun, but um, until I get a QA department, you're stuck with it. So my mom calls me Paul. Is she here somewhere? Yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> Pavlos is a totally fake name. When you're a hacker, you got to have one. Um, this is my expired American Express card. I don't actually know how they think this is more secure because I used to have to get your card out of your wallet in order to steal it. Now I just got to get near your ass in the line at Starbucks. <laughs> so, um, you know, 
So I have one of these on my robot now, and he just hangs out. No. <laughs> um, anyway, so you got the idea. Um, OK. Uh, there is an important point here, which is that credit cards are not actually supposed to be secure. We don't actually care because um, it's not a security problem. It's what you call a risk management problem, right? The credit card industry has figured out that credit cards are going to get stolen. Fine. Let's figure out how to profit off it. And so now what happens when I steal your credit card and I go shopping on victoriasecret.com is you get a statement and it says, yeah, that sounds exciting, but I didn't actually order that. <laughs> so you call your bank and you say, I didn't actually order that. And they say, no problem, here's your money back. So you didn't lose any money. Your bank calls Victoria's Secrets Bank and says, uh, that was fraudulent, so um, give us the money back. And they do, so your bank didn't lose any money. Victoria's Secrets Bank calls the merchant Victoria's Secret and says, give us the money back, that was fraudulent. And give us $25 chargeback free fee that we charge you whenever there's fraud. So now the merchant lost the product they sent me, what they originally got paid for it, the transaction fee, which is usually 2 or 3% for credit cards, and they lost $25 chargeback fee for fraudulent transactions. Everybody else is making money. Nobody else lost any money, only the merchant. That's risk management. We love that stuff. <laughs> Not every security problem has to be solved. Just figure out how to make money off them, and you're set. OK. This is a protocol diagram. I know this is exciting. Stick with me here. For SSL, which is the encryption system in your web browser. And that's what encrypts your credit cards when you send them to Victoria's Secret. We're going to go through this step by step. So you have to memorize. No. Um, hackers will attack every point in this protocol, right? That's what we do. We just try everything. What happens if I send a date from the future? What happens if I send two responses instead of one? What happens if I send a zero instead of a one? This gets really exciting, right? Because maybe it will break. And if it breaks, then maybe I can get it to break in some other way, like a way that gives me your credit card number, right? That's what's going on with hacking. We're just going to try everything. If you're building a product or a protocol, you're going to go and try and make it do one thing, what it's supposed to do. We're going to try and get it to do anything else, right? Who's going to win? This is what SSL actually looks like to a hacker. If you get bored after learning to pick locks, you can learn to read hexadecimal. Um, <laughs> that's how we do it. Um, I work in this lab. This is called the Intellectual Ventures Lab. Basically, the idea is we bought one of every tool in the world, and we hired one of every kind of scientist and a few crazy hackers. And what we try to do is invent stuff. We try to invent uh, solutions to problems, and we take on some of the biggest problems we can find. This guy is a problem. It's a mosquito, Anopheles stephensi, carrying malaria that he sucked out of somebody's blood in Africa, right? And she's killing about a million people a year. Half of them are kids under five. This is a big problem that remains to be solved. And we're working on this, but here's what I want you to understand. This is a protocol diagram for malaria, right? It spends a little bit of its life cycle in a human and a little bit of it in a mosquito. It's very complicated. We don't understand how this works, really, a little bit of it. And what I do in the lab is hire hackers to attack every point in this protocol, right? What happens if I send a date from the future? What happens if I send a zero instead of one or whatever, right? This is a biological protocol, so things are a little bit different. It doesn't use hexadecimal, but, you know, the rest is the same. And I need their minds, right? I don't know how to solve this problem. It might be a bunch of different things I have to come up with, right? We don't have the answers, and we need hackers. We need those kinds of minds to discover what's possible. And so if you know any hackers, you should rescue them from the computer security department and stick them into you know, science or product development or something. The old-fashioned way of attacking uh, <laughs> malaria 
is teach kids to sing songs about it. <laughs> this is literally a real ad from like the 30s, teaching kids to sing about DDT, um, which actually isn't good for you. <laughs> um, but we, what we did in America is we sprayed chemicals that kill everything. And we, you know, hope some of the good stuff comes back. That's how we got rid of malaria in America and Southern Europe. Unfortunately, Africa is really big and complex and DDT is politically unpopular and in addition to not being good for you. <laughs> and so we need new tools. So our idea was, hey, find those mosquitoes and shoot them down with lasers. <laughs> and uh, that's what we've been working on, um, among other things. <laughs> we thought it sounded funny too. And uh, then we thought, well, maybe we really can do it. And so um, if we could do it, then we could put a laser on a fence post around a building or a village, in this case around a crop to protect crops, and then the, the laser would just shoot all the mosquitoes as they're flying towards humans at dusk, right? This is what mosquitoes look like when they fly. Um, we started filming them to get to know our enemy. Um, it's actually some weird effect. It's not Bernoulli effect. We actually don't even understand how mosquitoes fly. We have a lot to learn about these things. Um, but then once we saw them flying, we started aiming lasers at them. This is what that looks like. So that's, this, is a, this is mosquitoes live, and we're tracking them with a computer. We track them using a video camera like you'd have like a webcam. And the chip like you'd have in a PlayStation does motion detection algorithms to find them. Oh, they're buzzing at me. And then once we have that information, we can aim a laser at them. And we use the laser galvo from like a laser printer, right? So these are cheap electronics. And it aims the laser at the mosquito. We use that laser to sample its wing beat frequency. From that, we can figure out, oh, it's a bug, it's a mosquito, it's an Ophelis defensi, and it's female. It's only the girls that carry malaria. So we don't shoot the boys. And then we shoot them down, and this is what that looks like. We just lit her up with an ultraviolet laser, and she's not coming back. Um, it's okay, you can enjoy yourselves here. Everyone hates mosquitoes. We vaporized her wing off, and she's gone. <laughs> um, it's kind of the universal enemy, really. Even PETA doesn't come and complain that we kill mosquitoes. <laughs> This is before we tuned our laser and we just vaporized the entire bug. Um, but what's cool about this is that computers have gotten cheap. Moore's law made it possible for us to compute the value of the life of every individual bug before we shoot it down. And that's unprecedented for humans, right? That kind of computational ability was laughable for our entire lives until now. And there's a lot of places where computers can go and that where they will go, um, that we're just beginning to figure out. And, um, and with that, you get you know, some of the uh, security issues, but I encourage you guys to think about hackers in a different light. They're really a precious natural resource, <laughs> and we shouldn't put them all in jail. Uh, just, <laughs> just saying. Anyway, my name is Pablos. There's my email address. Feel free to get in touch with me. Um, our website at the lab, intellectualventureslab.com, has all kinds of crazy projects. We invented a machine to suppress hurricanes. We invented a machine that can uh, uh, help reverse some of the effects of global warming. We invented a new type of nuclear reactor that runs on nuclear waste, all kinds of stuff. And, and I hope that you guys will uh, try to do big stuff and help us too. So, that's Fantastic. It. <laughs> so, um, that's just too cool for words. Uh, so there's some young people here. Sure. So you're at Intellectual Ventures, zapping mosquitoes. Before that, you, had a, uh, you helped found Blue Origin, work with Jeff Bezos and Neil Stevenson on trying to get people into space, building rockets, dreaming about other things. It, so there are young people here who yeah. want to do what you do. Uh, what advice would you give them? Um, well, I don't know if I have a repeatable career necessarily, even if that's wise, but a couple things have been learned. So, you know, one other thing that really strikes me is that up until, I was talking to someone earlier saying, 10 or 15 years ago, everything we knew about brains, we learned from dead ones, cutting them up. Like we didn't know what a brain was doing. And it's only been recently that we could observe a live brain in action. 
one of the things we've learned is that brains are really good at learning things that they're interested in, right? And I got really lucky because when I was a kid, I was really interested in computers. and Nobody had figured out that it was a waste of time yet. And so I spent all my childhood in front of a computer at home in the basement in the cold in the dark in Alaska <laughs> where there was nothing else going on. And it turned out to be a, okay for me um, because what happened is I, I learned at my own pace. I learned because I was interested and there was nothing slowing me down, right? And um, what everybody, I think, should be trying to do is find some situation. People say, you know, go find what you're passionate about. This is kind of like that. This is figure out what you're interested in and just learn that. Don't worry about whether it's actually a good idea or not. Don't worry about whether it's important. If you just keep doing that, you're going to learn a lot, right? You don't waste any time learning stuff you're not interested in. You'll learn a lot. And then eventually you'll be able to aim yourself at things that that interest you and that actually need you. And that's what happened to me. I ended up working on lots and lots of crazy projects and I always felt like I had to do a good job or, or whoever hired me would be disappointed and so I just kept doing something that was available to me and interesting. And now I keep working on crazier projects and there seems to be no end in sight. So, yeah. Really wonderful. Great, thank sure. you very much. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's thank Pablos again. Yeah.